Um, ladies and gentlemen, first I'd like to thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's been a rocky road to come to come here. I finally, I'm glad that I can be actually here this morning, and um, I'm uh, even more happy that I finished the slides because they were supposed to be done on the way, and because of the mix-up, <laughs> I got a little bit under time pressure. But I'm I'm fine for this one. So thanks again. And um, so the, um, if you talk about tissue valves, hold on, where's the mouse? Do we have a? How do I get this? Okay, all right. So, um, okay, now I get it. So if you, if you talk about uh, durability of tissue valves, that's something that's been going on for ages, for decades. And um, so the question is, why is it all of a sudden important again? And I think it is important again because of this here. You, we have received a lot of competition in the field, which uh, may be good or bad. I don't want to make a statement on this, but um, it's uh, certainly something that is there. And durability comes into play because um, if you look at this, in Germany, <laughs> In, in, in Germany, the developments, where's the, the mouse here doesn't work, I can't, do we have a pointer or something here? Okay, so in Germany, the, uh, um, the blue lines here, this is the development of aortic valve replacement in Germany. The blue is surgical aortic valve replacement, the uh, orange here, whatever that color is, um, is the transcatheter valves, and you see this number on top here, that's 6,000, another six or 7,000 will come on top of this here because they're not, listed in that registry. So in the end, we'll have about 30% of valves that are being still conventionally replaced in Germany, but the, the, ma the massive rest is, um, is transcatheter valves. So you may have, as a surgeon, you may get this feeling here, you're fighting a giant. And uh, so if there are still remaining issues with uh, transcatheter valves compared to conventional valves, and there's like uh, the thing pacemakers, paravalvular leaks, stroke, speed of recovery, early quality of life, valve thrombosis, and all these things doesn't, don't seem to matter at all if you did, uh, talk in the discussions. But there's one thing I believe that is relevant, and that is long-term durability. And um, if you talk about durability, then the cardiologists always uh, show you slides, slides like this from the advanced trial here, um, 800 core valve patients, uh, normal hemodynamics over a period of five years. Five years, that's it. So um, that's all they have so far. And um, then they have uh, definitions for what valve failure means, and then they have VAR criteria here, and according to the VAR criteria, 3% fail in, in this, those five years. Um, according to surgical criteria, which is an increase in pressure gradient for some reason, I don't know whether this is called surgical, but they have a 10% decrease, but this is all something that doesn't, uh, uh, haven't caused any uh, information there. So that, that's comparable to, you'll see this in a minute, to what we have. But then this is something that we all know. Um, valves don't fail within the first five years, and even the worst ones, like uh, the Toronto SPV, fails after like eight or nine years, and uh, significantly. So we do have a, a late onset of, uh, or a later onset as it's currently being discussed um, for f tissue valve failure. And um, so the, the question one can ask is, thank you. The qu one question you can ask is, uh, why do, do we have to talk about tissue valves? We just implant a mechanical valve. So if you look at the uh, Hammermeister trial, and the Edinburgh trial shows the same thing. There's a survival advantage for mechanical valves in a prospective randomized trial compared to tissue valves. And that survival advantage has been demonstrated by others. But then there is a, a recent, because we're moving to younger patients, there is a recent development and a recent analysis um, from the Californian registry. And um, they have analyzed the Californian, California and New York State state registries there, found more than 5,000 patients um, between the age of 18 and 50 in the time between 1997 and 2006. And the fraction of tissue moved in that time from 14% to 47%. And in the terms of survival, they found that the bioprosthetic one is going here, but there's no significant difference. So it's the same survival. They also found that stroke was 
higher with the bleed, uh, with the mechanical valves. Bleeding rates were higher, and of course, reoperations were high, higher with the tissue valves. Nothing wrong. So you have to, if you if you take those uh, um, values, then the difference between mechanical and tissue may not be present, at least in in older patients, in younger patients. I'm sorry. So if you look at the development as it is in Germany right now, there is a trend towards the use of more and more tissue valves and uh, less and less mechanical valves. So the fraction of tissue valves, regardless of age, is down to 90%, which means that even younger patients are getting more and more often tissue valves. And uh, you, you find evidence for this and that in the, in the uh, literature. And this, for example, is a very prominently published analysis of the same registry in California, only this is from Joe Wu, Joe Wu's group in Stanford, and um, what, what Joe did is they analyzed the registry, took 45,000 patients, now age 45 to 79, before it was 18 to 50. And they looked at almost the same time frame, and the fraction of tissue also moved in their time frame from 12 to 52. So the increase in tissue use is higher, but it's still they found something different. This is the hazard ratio for the aortic valve. And hazard ratio for using tissue over mechanical. So hazard valve is better. And look at this. It happens the mechanical valve is better up to the age of 55, they say in the manuscript. And for the biologic, uh, for the mechanical, um, for the mitral position, it is even up to 70% associated with the survival advantage. So the mechanical valves seem to provide, uh, seem to do better in terms of survival. And I think uh, this is a big discussion that's going on, and I'm always surprised because there's one issue that is never being addressed in this issue, and that, uh, in, in, the, in this discussion, and that is hemodynamics. And I've shown you that uh, the tissue valves, uh, the, the TAVI valves are performing well in terms of hemodynamics before. Um, they are performing better than surgical valves here in the Sertavi trial, and also the core valve trials usually show better hemodynamic performance than the surgical side. And if we implant sutureless valves, we can also see about four, per, four millimeter of mercury difference here. It's always the, the rapid deployment valve end up with a better hemodynamics, lesser, lower gradients than the other ones. And it's the same amount. It's always four millimeters of mercury above about the difference between the, the things. So uh, we've done something in Germany, in, in Jena, where we used the regular sizing strategy. We used the cylinder, measured the annulus, took the other side of the valve, of the sizer, we use only valves that have replica sizers. So we use the other side, see how it fits, and then we try one size bigger, or sometimes even two sizes bigger. And if that fits, we just implant it. And here's what happens. Here's for the Epic Supra. You can see if this is 21 annulus, and you implant a 21 size, this is the gradient you get. If you implant in the same patient just because his anatomy allows it, one size bigger or two sizes bigger, you drop by about four millimeters of mercury each time. So implanting a larger valve just because the space allows because we can is, is possible. And this is possible in 70% of the cases. So it's something that hemodynamics, we have it in our hands, and we all know mechanical valves do have better hemodynamics because they have a larger opening per given outside diameter. So this may be something where we can, we can actually have it. And look at the differences here, these sizes. These are all called 23, but they're all different outside diameters, all different sizers. It's, it's a mess, but I don't, this is not the topic of today. So what is then the actual durability of tissue valves? And this is so all, the valve, all of the studies we could find for, at five years. And you look see here, you, if, whether, whether you have the Perimount valve, the Hancock II, um, the Mitroflow or here the, the, the um, BioCore or Epic Supra, as I showed you just now, they're all the same. So at five years, there's no difference. At 10 years, some of the Perimounts start to fail, the BioCore seems to fail, the tissue valves, uh, the, the, the porcine valves seem to stay up here. Now you end up at 15 years, and all of a sudden you got the Mitroflow being hanging out here. But if you look at the Mitroflow, at this thing here, at um, at echocardiographic signs, then you see that at uh, 15 years, half of the valves are almost uh, affected by uh, structural valve deterioration. So this is a something that uh, there is decrease, and uh, at 20 years, there's only a few papers left that show results, and you can see here the uh, Perimount, there's one poor one, one good one. This is the Hancock, and Tyrone calls this the gold standard. 
So um, that may have to do because you can find reasons why this value is not correct and the other value is not correct. The BioCore, Epic Supra, that's the, what it's called now, um, they, have, they seem to have, at least in my view, uh, the, one of the best outcomes in all the trials, but the number of trials and number of informations there is, is limited. So the other, th then if you look at it from a valve specific standpoint, now you look at perimount valve only, all studies, five, 10, 15, 20 years, you see a decrease here and you end up around 60% at 20 years. If you do that for the Hancock too, this may be a little slow, not as steep. So you end up maybe at 70%. And if you do this for the EPIC or BioCore, you may end up even with higher numbers, but that's it. So in other words, and this is also the same statement that Tyrone has always made, the, the uh, porcine valves seem to outperform the, tissue, the, the uh, pericardial valves in the long run. And this is also, this is a, a recent a meta regression that um, was done here by Wang and Manson, and they um, have done this for the Mitroflow, Perimont, Hancock, but they didn't use the uh, data for the EPIC. But they end up, you can see the Mitroflow, they start, the, the, the decrease starts early, and this is all age dependent, and the younger the patient, the, the, the slower or the, the less durable the valves are. And you can see here, and you can you sort of pick your own study. But the important information is that every valve has its own failure mechanism and its own failure time frame. And so um, one issue that may come into, into play here may be valve thrombosis. And um, you've seen this for TAVI, and uh, this has been uh, presented with the portico valve, and it happens at all times. But and what, if, you, if you have this from, this is also TAVI thrombosis, you have a decrease in, um, you have a decrease in uh, um, the, the thrombosis problem if you anticoagulate but it doesn't help if you could do double platelet. So if you have a thrombosis, then uh, anticoagulation may help. But the important part for us is that also happens with surgical valves. And it doesn't happen right at the beginning. This is an analysis from the Mayo Clinic. It happens at all times, and in the average, it happens around 30 months after surgery. So it's something that you have to watch out for, and if an early failure comes, then look for uh, possible thrombosis and try anticoagulation. So I'm coming to the end. Durability as listed from the gold standard. This is Tyrone dependent on age. The older the patient, the less likely the valve is going to fail. The younger the patient, the more likely. So here comes the only durability data that are currently available from, uh, um, from the Tarvi Center. Stuff where probably some cardiologists would like me to step off right now because they want, don't want this to be shown. This is, um, uh, uh, Danny Dvier has demonstrated this um, and it's been heavily criticized again. Uh, echo freedom from tissue valve degeneration on echo signs, but there is a at very poor at, at um, um, eight years and these patients were 83. So this may be the point where, you know, the giant gets kicked out of the ring by the little ones. And um, so we, if you put this together, you know, you may, uh, may see the So I think that if you have a patient that has a prognosis and that has life expectancy, then it's important um, to talk about durability in that find. So in summary, I think durability of surgically implanted tissue valves, they can be excellent even at younger age. And the younger the patient, the shorter the expected life expectancy. If early valve failure appears, consider valve thrombosis, and it may not be, have to be replaced, re-replaced. It may just be treated with anticoagulation. Um, however, and that is important, tissue valve durability is valve-specific. It doesn't mean that tissue valves last this long, but it's only this one tissue valve lasts this long, and the other one may not, just Toronto SPV. So, uh, in other words, every valve has to stand its own test of time. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>